Satan, who is the god of this world, age, has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They do not understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4. Greetings mortals and a capital day to you all. I'm your humble host Simon and you are watching the Library of Gnosis. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was not convincing the world that he did not exist. It was convincing the world that he was God. Now this is gonna be quite a controversial video. But if it can be destroyed by the truth, it deserves to be destroyed. In today's video we will be examining the true nature of the God most Christians and Jews call their God. This is Yahweh of course. The early Israelites were polytheistic and worshipped Yahweh alongside a variety of other Canaanite gods and goddesses, including El, Asherah and Baal. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Exodus 34.14 And in all things that I have said unto you, be circumspect, and make no mention of the name of other gods. Neither let it be heard out of thy mouth. Exodus 23.13 Second Temple Judaism and Rabbinical Judaism are emphatically monotheistic. However, its predecessor, the cult of Yahweh, as it was practiced in ancient Israelite during the 8th and 7th centuries BCE, Yahwism, has been described as henotheistic or monolatric. Yahweh does not deny that there are other gods, but whose name is Jealous. Yahweh wanted to be the high god. In Christianity, Lucifer is another name for Satan. He was jealous of God's position as high god, and he tried to overthrow God, to replace him as the most high. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou shalt hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit upon the mount of the congregation, in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities, thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners, all the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his house, but thou art cast out thy grave, like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword, that go down to the stones of the pit, as carcasses trodden under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land, and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Isaiah 14.12
The Fall of Lucifer mirrors one Sumerian account where Enlil forces himself upon his wife and as a punishment he is cast down into the underworld. Lucifer is sometimes identified as having been the chief of the angels or the king of the angels. The exact same position that Enlil had as the king of the gods. According to one Sumerian hymn, Enlil himself was so holy that not even the other gods could look upon him. Again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lament of the king of Tyre, and tell him that this is what the Lord God says. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you, a ruby, topaz and diamond, beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and emerald. Your mountings and settings were crafted in gold, prepared on the day of your creation. You were anointed as the guardian cherub, for I had ordained you. You were on the holy mountain of God, you walked among the fiery stones. From the day you were created, you were blameless in your ways until wickedness was found in you. By the vastness of your trade, you were filled with violence, and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mountain of God, and I banished you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart grew proud of your beauty, you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I cast you to the earth. I made you a spectacle before kings. By the multitude of your iniquities and the dishonesty of your trading, you have profaned your sanctuaries. So I made fire come from within you, and it consumed you. I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the eyes of all who saw you. All the nations who knew you were applied over you. You have come to a horrible end and will be no more. Ezekiel 28.11 Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, requires animal sacrifices. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Hebrews 9.22 Ancient Mesopotamian deities expected to be fed twice a day without fail by their human worshippers. As befitted divine rulers, they also expected a steady diet of meat. From at least 200 BCE onwards, a tradition developed in the Greco-Egyptian Ptolemaic Kingdom, which identified Yahweh, the god of the Jews, with the Egyptian god of chaos, Seth. Seth was of course jealous of his brother Osiris for being king and wished to overthrow him, so he murdered Osiris. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth 
in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet, because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. John 8.42 Here Jesus is speaking to the Orthodox Jews, who of course follow the Mosaic laws and worship Yahweh. He is literally telling them that Yahweh is the devil. Once again he speaks to the Jews and tells them that they are not worshipping the right father. So the Jews gathered around him and demanded, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. I already told you, Jesus replied, But you did not believe the works I do in my Father's name testify on my behalf. But because you are not my sheep, you refuse to believe. John 10.24 To me, it almost seems as if Yahweh is schizophrenic. He is the mad God. Yahweh is also a micromanager with the most odd commandments. For instance, the stoning of oxes. When an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall not be liable. Exodus 2.1 We of course also find proper and just commandments in the Mosaic laws, such as thou shall not kill, rape or steal. This is what makes Yahweh such a complex character. He is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Almost as if he has got split personality disorder. In psychological terms, we can see Yahweh as representing the ego. The ego is the source of insanity. Most people are ego driven and as such, most people are insane. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Matthew 16.23 The ego has all the intelligence of the alpha predator on this planet at its disposal. And we should approach it as though it is an alpha predator. He is a tempter, a manipulator, a deceiver, and when all else fails, he can be violent and murderous. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy the devil prowls around you like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. 1 Peter 5.8 This is why we have scumbags like quote-unquote law enforcement who worship Mammon and will do anything for a paycheck which will follow any command given to them by their satanic overlords. I cannot even begin to describe how despicable these fucking people are. They reject God's law and enforce the laws of the same people who crucified our Savior. Yet they call themselves quote-unquote law enforcement. They are liars just like their father. The elites are barely even trying to hide that they worship Satan any more from their minions. At least in the past they used to be subtle. 
Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Matthew 7.15 But does this mean we should hate Yahweh? Or should we instead pity the insane? Satan knows scripture better than any human, and he knows that he will lose in the end. Yet he persists. Is not one definition of insanity doing the same thing over and over again, expecting other results? He tells you not to murder, then he orders genocide. He is not only a hypocrite, but a homicidal mass murderer. Let us take a look at a few examples from the Old Testament. Anyone arrogant enough to reject the verdict of the judge or of the priest who represents the Lord your God must be put to death. Such evil must be purged from Israel. Deuteronomy 17.12 If a man lies with a male as with a woman, both of them shall be put to death for their abominable deed. They have forfeited their lives. Leviticus 20.13 Suppose you hear in one of the towns the Lord your God is giving you that some worthless rabble among you have led their fellow citizen astray by encouraging them to worship foreign gods. In such cases, you must examine the facts carefully. If you find it is true and can prove that such a detestable act has occurred among you, you must attack that town and completely destroy all its inhabitants, as well as all the livestock. Then you must pile all the plunder in the middle of the street and burn it. Put the entire town to the torch as a burnt offering to the Lord your God. That town must remain a ruin forever. It may never be rebuilt. Keep none of the plunder that has been set apart for destruction. Then the Lord will turn from his fierce anger and be merciful to you. He will have compassion on you and make you a great nation, just as he solemnly promised your ancestors. The Lord your God will be merciful only if you obey him and keep all the commands I am giving you today, doing what is pleasing to him. Deuteronomy 13.13 13. Then they waged war against Midian, as the Lord had commanded Moses, and they killed every male. Among the slain were Evi, Rikim, Sur, Hur, and Reba, the five kings of Midian. They also killed Balaam, son of Beor, with the sword. The Israelites captured the Midianite women and their children, and they plundered all their herds, flocks, and goods. Then they burned all the cities where the Medeans had lived, as well as all their encampments 
and carried away the plunder and spoils, both people and animals. They brought the captives, spoils and plunder to Moses, to Elasar the priest, and to the congregation of Israel at the camp of the plains of Moab, by the Jordan across from Jericho. And Moses, Elasar the priest, and all the leaders of the congregation went to them outside the camp. But Moses was angry with the officers of the army, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, who were returning from battle. Have you spared all the women? he asked them. Look, these women caused the sons of Israel, through the counsel of Balaam, to turn unfaithfully against the Lord at Peor, so that the plague struck the congregation of the Lord. So now, kill all the boys, as well as every woman who has had relations with a man. But spare for yourself every girl who has never had relations with a man. Numbers 31.7 This is the God most Jews and Christians worship. He is a mass murderer who condones rape and the killing of babies. Thankfully, most Christians put their focus on the New Testament. Anyone who beats their male or female slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a direct result. But they are not to be punished if the slave recovers after a day or two, since the slave is their property. Exodus 21.20 Jesus pretty much explicitly condemned slavery with his golden rule. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Matthew 7.12 In this next verse, Yahweh sends serpents to kill his followers for disobeying him. See. I will send venomous snakes among you, wipers that cannot be charmed, and they will bite you, declares the Lord. Jeremiah 8.17 Jesus then refutes that Yahweh is his father. Which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg? will give him a scorpion. If you, then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give thy Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Luke 11.11 11. In this next verse, Yahweh condemns pork as unclean. The pig is also unclean. Although it has a divided hoof, it does not chew the cud. You are not to eat their meat or touch their carcasses. Deuteronomy 14.8 Jesus then refutes this commandment. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. Romans 14.14 14. Yahweh exalts himself above all the other gods, again and again, just like Lucifer wanted to be the God Most High. See. Now that I, even, I am he, and there is no God beside me. I kill and make alive, I wound and I heal. There is none that can deliver out of my hand. Deuteronomy 32.39
Yehovah is a Latinization of the Hebrew Yahovah. One vocalization of the tetragrammaton Yehovah. The proper name of the God of Israel in the Hebrew Bible slash Old Testament. Now, while Yehovah is probably not the proper pronunciation of the name, it is often used by Christians. I think we should take a closer look at the name Yehovah. In Hebrew, Ye, Ye, or Yah means Lord or God. The suffix Hova is number 1943 in Strong's Hebrew Dictionary and has the meaning of ruin, mischief. In another form of number 1942, Hava, which is translated as calamity, iniquity, mischief, mischievous thing, naughtiness, naughty, noisome, perverse thing, substance, very wickedness. Put the two Jehovah together and you get the god of ruin, mischief, calamity, perversion, and wickedness. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Isaiah 45, 7 In the Apocryphon of John, Yaldabaoth is the first of the three names of the domineering archon, along with Saklas, which means fool, and Samael, which means poison of God. Samael is an archangel in Talmudic and post-Talmudic lore, a figure who is the accuser or adversary, Satan in the book of Job, seducer and destroying angel, in the book of Exodus. Although many of his functions resemble the Christian notion of Satan, to the point of sometimes being identified as a fallen angel, he is not necessarily evil, since his functions are also regarded as resulting in good, such as destroying sinners. He is considered in Mistraic text to be a member of the heavenly host with often grim and destructive duties. One of Samuel's greatest roles in Jewish lore is that of the main angel of death and the head of Satan's. Although he condones the sins of man, he remains one of God's servants. In Judaism, Satan is seen as an angel subservient to God, typically regarded as a metaphor for the Yetzer Hara or evil inclination. In Christianity and Islam, he is usually seen as a fallen angel or a jinn who has rebelled against God, who nevertheless allows him temporary power over the fallen world and a host of demons. Samuel as the guardian angel and prince of Rome, he is the arch enemy of Israel. By the beginning of Jewish culture in Europe, Samuel had been established as a representative of Christianity due to his identification with Rome. The prince of Rome of course, do I need to mention that it was the Romans who crucified Jesus. Wherever in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Ephesians 2.2 2. In the oldest biblical literature, Yahweh possesses attributes typically ascribed to weather and war deities. Enlil is an ancient Mesopotamian god 
associated with wind, air, earth, and storms. Enlil's name comes from the ancient Sumerian En, meaning Lord, and Lil, the meaning of which is contentious and which has sometimes been interpreted as meaning winds as weather phenomenon, making Enlil a weather and sky god, Lord Wind or Lord Storm. In some versions of the Sumerian texts, An and Ki mated with each other, causing Ki to give birth to Enlil. Although the ancestry of Enlil is generally unclear and unsubstantiated. The song of Kumarbi in this myth, Kumarbi, who is equated with the Mesopotamian Enlil, seeks to overthrow Anu, the chief god, and take his place. Kumarbi bites off and swallows Anu's genitals leading to Anu's subsequent loss of power. Enlil separated Anu from Ki and carried off the earth as his domain, while Anu carried off the sky. Enlil marries his mother, Ki, and from this union all the plant and animal life on earth is produced. Yaldabaoth is the name the Gnostics gave to the Demiurge, or the creator of the material world, who they equate with Yahweh. Yahweh is the Sumerian Enlil, who cleaves apart Anu and Ki, in essence creating the material world. Earth is the domain of Enlil, for now at least. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then, out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession, although the whole earth is mine. Exodus 19.5 I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me. John 14.30 for the Lord Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. Psalm 47 2 We know that we are children of God, and the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true by being in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. 1 John 5.19 Take notice of this last verse. It emphasizes that he is the true God, which would seem to imply that there is one false god. Not many as orthodox Christians would argue all the other gods are. Now the question is, why does the benevolent high god allow Satan temporary power over the fallen world? Well, it seems it might have something to do with the cosmic laws that govern this world of duality. In Hinduism, we find their cosmology of the world, which has something that is known as yugas. Spring, summer, autumn, winter. Everything happens in cycles. Kali Yuga, in Hinduism, is the fourth and the worst of the four yugas, world ages, in a yuga cycle preceded by the Dwarpa Yuga and followed by the next cycle Satya Yuga. Kali Yuga is believed to be the present age, which is full of conflict and sin. The Kali Yuga is ruled by what the Christians would call Satan. According to these cycles, after the Kali Yuga, the next world age is the Satya Yuga 
which is the Golden Age. Now, these ages do of course not have a clear representation in the Bible. But at least one verse in the Bible seems to be referencing the zodiacal ages. I think I have some good news. Jesus, when asked by his disciples when they should expect his return, responded. And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. Luke 22.10 This might be referencing the age of Aquarius, whose symbol is a man carrying a pitcher of water, which we are just now currently entering. The exact date to this is hard to pin down, but we will be entering the age of Aquarius in the next few hundred years. Now, of course, the changes will not be noticed instantly, but we will slowly start rising into the new age. The symbol of Aquarius is a man carrying a pitcher of water. This is a symbol for Enki, who was the Sumerian god of water. And Jesus, of course, could walk on water. He was the master of it. I am sure there are many, many more connections proving that Yahweh is actually Satan. But I think this will have to do for now. Can I prove that Yahweh is Satan? Well, no, and quite frankly, it is an extremely blasphemous claim. I am well aware of this fact. but. This is what my research and scripture itself points towards. I would personally prefer if this was not the case. It is quite frankly a horrifying proposition. But I am afraid that the truth is sometimes a harsh mistress. If you like the work I am doing, then please consider becoming a member of my Patreon. One of the benefits of doing this is that you will have access to all my scripts, which includes all the sources I used. The lowest tier will give you access to all of this, and it's only $3. I want to thank you all for watching. I will see you in the next broadcast, mortals.